Explosion Network podcast is never late, nor are they early. They arrive precisely when they're meant to. Welcome to the Lord of the Rings Extended, a middle Earth podcast from ExplosionNetwork.com. This is our first ever episode of the Lord of the Rings Extended, a middle Earth podcast. Welcome. My name's Don Blight, and joining me, Ashley Hobley. Hey, Dylan, excited to be here, going through Middle Earth with you. Thank you very much. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Shire. The Shire? Okay. You live in the Shire? You're a hobbit? Yeah, I'm totally yeah, okay. a hobbit. No, you wouldn't I'm be a hobbit, actually. A hobbit. I'm 100% a hobbit. I don't even care. I ain't fucking around. I'm 100% creature <laughs> comforts and uh, just chilling, you know? Um, so the idea for this podcast is we will be doing, if you listen to any of our uh, ExplosionNetwork.com podcast, which you may or may not have, but we've done a few of these sorts of spin-off podcasts and stuff like for our Marvel ones, Star Wars ones and stuff like that. We watch all the movies and stuff like, in particular, I guess, all new Marvel cast, our Marvel podcast. We did a rewatch of all the Marvel movies, so that was all on the feed. It's up to date. Now we spend all the time on that podcast talking about the TV shows and movies and stuff as they happen. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through all of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit uh, movies, all six movies on this. We will be watching and talking about all of the extended editions as well. And then that's these will release right up until the TV show, uh, which drops on like September, whatever it is, six or something um, on Amazon. And then we will be talking about that week by week, episode by episode on here um, going forward. And that, that's where you'll find all of that information. So before we actually get into talking about The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey, which is, we are starting with The Hobbit as much as Kieran hates it. Um, we're doing them in chronological, cool, not release order. <laughs> um, Want to get everyone's like general uh, Middle Earth, Lord of the Rings, you know, like history, how they would say they feel about the franchise or like and stuff like that um, in a whole. Uh, Kieran? Uh, as a whole, I love Lord of the Rings and I love um, Middle Earth as a setting. J.R.R. Tolkien is one of my narrative uh, role models or people that I look up to in terms of storytelling and I always have an appreciation for his world building. Um, growing up, The Hobbit was one of my favorite books. I loved The Hobbit. Um, and I, I always appreciated the, the journey that Bilbo goes on. And, and it was a book that I... I found it very easy to read a lot of the time, which is very interesting when you compare it to Lord of the Rings, which as an older kind of written for an older audience is a very much a heavier book to read. Um, but no, I absolutely adore um, Lord of the Rings, both the extended cuts and theatrical cuts. The Hobbit is where things for me get a little bit uh, dicey in terms of just how I feel about the movies and, and everything around them. Ash? I love the movies. I watched them as they came out in cinemas. Every year I would be down to visit my grandparents and we'd go see uh, with my aunt to go see the movies uh, as they were coming out. Uh, I've never read the books. <laughs> I've tried. I probably I did own them at one point. Never read them. Couldn't get into it. You know? As in The Hobbit as well as Lord of the Rings? Yeah, all of it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, I went to see all the Hobbit movies day one because why not? I had to complete the set. Completionist. Completionist. <laughs> um, so I remember watching The Lord of the Rings uh, growing up as I was releasing on, uh, it would have been VHS at the time, I guess, and then maybe Return of the King or something was DVD by the time. I didn't watch any of them in the cinema. Um, that's showing the age difference between myself and Ash. Um, mm. But yeah, I was not watching it in the cinema. Really? Because I watched the, I watched Fellowship in well, my the parents had, I was far too young. My parents had no interest. I don't... They wouldn't go with me and watch it for three hours. So <laughs> My sister and my dad both okay, loved yeah, Tolkien so as well, it. so... I went along with them. I remember walking to school one day after seeing Fellowship and having like a silly kid argument with my sister because she was like, oh, Aragorn's my favorite character. And I was like, no, my favorite character is Strider and he would kick Aragorn's ass, not realizing that Aragorn is Strider and they're the, the same <laughs> Ooh, character. What a dumb kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but i used to watch the movies a lot um i really enjoyed them i found them quite confusing though that's the thing like i will admit totally when when i was a kid um like watching them how old mm -hmm. i would have been like watching fellowship even for the first time um there's just like 
races, uh, places, you know, like the law and everything. Like it's quite, it's a lot, um, I think, to take in for a, a, a younger kid, that's for sure. Um, but it's mm. like also just the characters and it's like, even if you didn't fully understand it, I was, the, the general idea of, I need to get this ring and stick it in a fucking volcano. Like, you're like, yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can get aboard this. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sauron, bad guy, wizard, this guy's good, this wizard, once good, now bad. You know, like, it's very easy, orcs bad, you know, like, you can get, you can get aboard. Um, I've read The Hobbit when I was in high school. I could barely remember it, though. Um, I've never read any of The Lord of the Rings, though. I did own them at one stage. Um, I don't even know if I still do. They might be in a bookcase somewhere, but no, I haven't read any of the other books. I read The Hobbit solely because it was the much shorter one and I could um, smash through that shit, which I did. Um, I enjoyed it from memory, <laughs> but yeah, I, I I'm not some super fan who's read the books multiple times or like knows them back of my hand or anything like that. I would put myself definitely in a category of like, I am a Lord of the Rings. I like the Lord of the Rings, but I'm not going to like pretend to be some super massive fan of the... The, the lore and universe and all these sorts of things. I've watched the animated one. I own that on DVD as well. The uh, Lord of the Rings movie. So I was about to ask, are we going to be doing the 1978 version? No, it's terrible. Uh, no. It is terrible. But I do want <laughs> just it. Just to yeah, see the no, just We should review the Hobbit video game from the PS2 era because that game was. I awesome. played that. I played all the, the like, the, the, the other ones, though, like the two fellowship, like the two towers, RPG. Return of King. Action the RPG. original Fellowship game yeah. was very good. Well, that was well. a stealth one. It was really hard. And then Return of King was like more action based and stuff like that. So, quite like, no, they were good games and stuff. Uh, but yeah, so that's where we're at on that. Oh, I watched all the Hobbit movies in the cinema um, as well. I drove mm-hmm. down to um, a different cinema to watch either of those at release because I was quite excited for them. Um, now, we'll go for all three. Sorry? For all three, you yeah. drove down somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So each time, well, you're I like, watch. This will be the one. I watch. Yeah. I did hate them upon release, and I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go over I'm, thoughts for each movie as we get to them. But yeah, <laughs> I still watch all three of these in gold class. I think because wow. uh, like my sister and me had a thing where it was like for Lord of the Rings, like Harry Potter and stuff. We would watch it in gold class on release weekend. Yeah. It's just a tradition. Yeah. yeah. All right. This week's movie. The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, synopsis is a reluctant hobbit, Bilbo Baggins, sets out to the lonely mountain with a spirited group of dwarves to reclaim their mountain home and the gold within from the dragon Schmaug. Directed by Peter Jackson, Schmaug. written by Fran Walsh, Philip Boynes, Peter Jackson, Gilmero Del Toro, based on the novel by, of course, J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, so the first time we all watched this movie, what were your thoughts at the time, especially because presumably coming off watching um you know the the lord of the rings trilogy academy award winning massive everyone loves it i feel like we all would have gone into it really excited do you know how you felt walking out of this the first time kieran and have have you watched it since or is this your first rewatch i have not watched it since this is my first rewatch in a very long time and i think it's actually been in quite interesting almost 10 um, years then yeah it's quite interesting looking back at it um I remember I was actually pretty optimistic. I, I was optimistic, but at the same time, a bit pessimistic about this movie go, at once coming out of it, because I think Unexpected Journey is the cl- one that is closest to the book and is closest to the events of the book in terms of uh, kind of moment to moment storytelling and narrative storytelling. But it was starting to sprinkle in that this is all the extra stuff we've got, because I remember going into The Hobbit, I was always really worried about because when they initially announced The Hobbit, they announced it as, hey, it's going to be two movies, and then all of a sudden it turned into three movies. And I was, you know, I was already at that point worried because I was like, oh, how the fuck do they turn a book that is smaller than Fellowship of the Ring into three movies? How do they stretch it across? And it's not just going to be like three 90-minute movies. It's going to be three two-hour, you know, two-hour, 245 um, kind of length movies and, and it was worrying this one coming out of it yeah very much was oh okay they didn't do too badly i can see what they're doing um i can see that what they're adding um for it but yeah this they've, they've still maintained a lot of the the central and core moments from the hobbit that i loved ash i have no idea i, I think i enjoyed it because you know i tend to like stuff, so because uh, <laughs> I yeah, tend to like stuff. <laughs> just be like positive, <laughs> mostly po- generally more positive than other people. You know, no, you're not. <laughs> well, maybe you were at the time. 
<laughs> before I was corrupted yeah. by. I think it uh, helps when you don't have a preconceived yeah. idea of like you don't have the original I mean, source material. You know, you have we'll get into it, but obviously but you have the original Lord of the Rings films as well to go from. You do. But Yeah, I think I liked it for the most part then. What about you, Dylan? Yeah, I remember liking it. I remember like going in, I felt like it was a bit too long and dragged out certain elements, but I remember really enjoying the cast. And thinking that was like the sort of really important and another factor that carried over mm-hmm. from Lord of the Rings is like casting wise and everything. I feel like everyone worked out really, really well for who they went with. Um, so that's what I wanted to jump into next. So like, Kieran, Bilbo Baggins, Martin Freeman. How do you how do you feel about that casting? Do you think he's? I think Martin Freeman is excellent as Bilbo Baggins. I think he is spot on, and and you know there is some uh, a little bit weird moments for him in it that I don't p- particularly love. But as a whole, I think Martin Freeman does a fantastic job in the role of Bilbo. Like the the transition from um, into Martin Freeman in this movie is done spectacularly, and you you believe that this is the version of Bilbo at this point in time in his life before he's been on an adventure when he's just your typical Hobbit homebody. Like it is. I think, yeah, as a whole, he does a really good job um, of bringing Bilbo Baggins at that age to life. Yeah, that's. I think he's really good casting as well. I've, I've absolutely no problems. I don't think Martin Freeman's anything to do with any issues these three movies have. Would you say the same, Ash? No, it was great. I think he's great casting. Yeah. I mean, he looks hobbitish. <laughs> uh, and you know he can play that kind of role before because he played a very similar role in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know? A person who gets randomly thrown into some crazy adventure. <laughs> I'm going on an adventure. Um, but I was, I was quite in that line of them was recording something else. I kept being like, I'm going on an adventure. And Ash is like, what the fuck? I was like, it's a classic line. He says it in the movie. <laughs> he does. Well, he's following yeah. his contract. He used to say it in the trailer all really the, the time. The piece, of, um, the piece of music that plays during that is probably my favorite out of the Hobbit as a whole. Um, is, uh, so there's really no good. music in this as good as anything in Lord of the Rings, but it's still decent. Of course. Um, yeah. Right. On this watch, Kieran, let's get into it. Sit down. You weren't looking forward to doing this, to be fair. Especially when we're like, we're doing the extended cuts. So you have to watch more of a movie you already don't like. This one's only, it's 10, only 10 minutes, minutes longer. So that's, it's, it's like, not that. It's, it's only 10 minutes longer. So the end it's of the not world. terrible. Yeah. And there's not. Um, I think, you know what? Sitting down, I actually, I think I realized what the problem, what my problem is with this movie is that it was released after Lord of the Rings. Yes. The, my problem with this movie is that it was released after the Lord of the Rings so that when the writers have gone into this, they have felt like we need to make this as connected to Lord of the Rings as possible. We need to make sure that this has so many callbacks to Lord of the Rings and we have we have so many characters coming back from Lord of the Rings and, and, and making sure that we've got all these through lines and, and things that's like, haha, you remember this from the future, this is now. And and I think, you know, one or two points, that hits really well and that works really well. As a whole, it doesn't work really well because the, the, the joy of The Hobbit as a book is that it is a more simplified child story about a hobbit going on an adventure. And it puts these building blocks in place for um, Lord of the Rings. Like, it puts them there, but it's not obvious that it's putting those in place. The ring for for Bilbo, the ring is just a magic ring that he gets his hands on. He doesn't he doesn't have the the weird protectiveness over the ring very much in the book. He isn't you know isn't compelled to it. It is there's a lot of mystery around the ring still, yes, but it doesn't have that darkness surrounding it like we know it does in Lord of the Rings, and, and they feel like they need to have that as a three point in in this movie. And then I think there's a lot of addition in this movie. And, and it's where it started to worry me on my initial original viewing was like, oh, okay, they're trying to add all this extra stuff that doesn't happen in the book to try and pad out run times, to try and validate it having a, you know, three movie run. Um, you know, there are points that I love. I love the, um, uh, I can never remember if they're trolls or I think they're trolls. Uh, the the troll segment where with Frodo uh, Frodo Bilbo's first attempt at being a burglar sneaking and trying to save the horses mm-hmm. the dwarves getting caught and then that that sequence is that is that is really good that is just pulled straight out of the book there are moments all over the place you know I remember and I still got it there's um 
the initial kind of lead in moment where Bilbo actually reads the starting lines to um, the Hobbit when he is describing the Shire and describing the Hobbit hole. Um, those are just pulled directly from the book. I just think there is too much effort put into this movie to make you remember that it's connected to Lord of the Rings and this movie is leading towards Lord of the Rings instead of letting it be its own story and letting it, you know, flow naturally within itself. That's fair. Ash? Uh, Yeah, I liked it on this rewatch. Like, I think it's a fun film. It is probably a bit long and, you know... uh, I feel like the thing that I most realized was, yeah, like Kieran said, that it felt like there were like stunt casting a lot of people, bringing a lot of people back. You know, did we really need Kate Blanchett to come uh, be in the film for like five minutes? Uh, did we really need Hugo Weaving to be in the film for like 10 minutes? Uh, <laughs> did, did we really need Christopher Lee to come back for three minutes? You know? Uh, and then even the book endings of it, like, bringing uh, Elijah Wood back. It's like, man, they're just trying to make sure you remember this is part of the same that universe. Is the only one I, that's the only one I loved. That's the only one I loved is Elijah Wood in the opening for it, but that's just your yeah, personal opinion. Yeah, okay. I didn't mind it, I mean, but... <laughs> I mean, it's cool, I guess, from the book ending that it kind of fits in. This is to, this He's writing this, I guess, the day before the party that kicks off the events of Lord of the Rings. Um, so I guess interesting in that regard, but uh, it's cool to have um, who is it? Uh, who plays old Bilbo? Um, Ian Holm. Ian Holm back, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's cool. You know, it's nice to see Gandalf. Ian McKellen does a fantastic job. Uh, a lot more singing in this than I remembered. There's a lot of music, <laughs> which is you know what's really interesting. There is a lot of singing cut out of compared to the book because there's a lot in the book there's a lot of singing in the book but yeah there was the more singing than i was expecting i was like oh yeah there's that one scene where they're like singing where they're doing dinner it's a musical no there's there's more there's so much singing it's almost a musical it's extended cut the musical edition yeah yeah a lot of that i think there is uh i think there's only two songs in the original theatrical version um the I think the scene with the elves is added, and that the elves is added. definitely added for hundred percent. Um, yeah, but with him dancing on the table. Yeah, and throwing yeah, food around. I believe so, off the top yeah. of my head. I believe because I believe the whole of Rivendell is kind of there's a lot more added yeah, into that there is. section to kind of um like them being butt naked. In the <laughs> thing, I was like, I'm okay with this. <laughs> uh, the other thing I think is like. I had to, I have no idea who half these dwarves are. <laughs> I remember Thorin. I remember Keeley, played by Aiden Turner. You, you remember Keeley because he's the hot one. He's the one who tries to bang the elf. So I know, remember him. I see the, the foreshadowing in this one. When they cut, when they cut, when they were casting a movie, and I was like reading about the casting in say like Empire Magazine at the time. I think they cast Aiden Turner. And I used to watch the show. He was in um, Being Human. So when they cast him, I was like, oh, yeah, that guy. I really like him from that show. So that's that's the reason I remember him. Mm-hmm. But yeah, other than that, I don't really... There's, there's the a couple dude. that don't really get their chances um, to, to shine. But yeah. There's a lot of them. There's, yeah. <laughs> How do you miss out Boffer? Boffer is the easy one, right? Boffer's just fat. And then you got Feely and Keely because they're brothers. No, I don't know if they're brothers or they're just similarly named. Um, you have Gimli's no, dad brothers, in yeah. there. Um, yeah, you have Gloin. Gloin's in there. You have Balin. See, um, I don't remember any of their names. If I wasn't yeah. looking at this Wikipedia article, I wouldn't know. I've known. I would have just called <laughs> them. I think that that is the the. Ah, there is a weirdness about the stuff they've added. Means they squash down a lot of stuff from the books. Where in the books you get more of a chance to get to know each of the characters and get to know each of the dwarves. Whereas this one, yeah, it's very strange. And I think it gets worse as these movies go along. What stuff they actually, like, what source material they squash to add all this extra shit in. Yeah. They need to name tags, is what I'm saying. Mm. Uh. <laughs> um, I, I, had a, I had fun with this. I, I still think it's like, and I, I'm going to say now that I'm pretty sure 
off the top of my head, all of these movies, like I never really thought any of them were great. I didn't think any of them were terrible either. And um, we'll see how that goes as I go forward. I think the magic of Middle Earth overshadows some of the filmmaking problems, if that makes sense. Like there is an element of the chemistry between the cast, having a lot of uh, people, someone like on screen, like Ian McKellen, who just brings so much presence. Like there's, there's a lot of things like that, that sort of just cover band-aid over a lot of the either mm-hmm. script issues or just general story issues, these sorts of things. Um, just the general dragging out of everything. Um, it's all like the talent just overshadows everything else that's going on. The, the magic of the middle earth universe overshadows whatever's going on. Like you watch the movie and you're like watching a, this, the opening of this film goes forever. And he, all you're doing is have this bloody dinner, but you're just like, fuck, it's just fun to be around these characters. Like, <laughs> I love that dinner, that dinner, that, that's such a, just that whole interaction. And those, it's just, yeah. yeah. I think that's the, that's the it's thing. Special. Even though I'm like, this is dragging out for so long. And that's the majority of the scenes. Nearly, nearly every scene or moment in this movie, I'm like, this could have been cut. Like this could have been cut or it could have been way shorter, but everyone's just fun to be around. So it's like a negative and a positive, weird positive at the same time. Cause yeah, ultimately I really enjoyed the, the, the car, like the characters and the world, even if I just think that this should have been two movies. Ideally, I, I think like I, I can understand two movies. I, the three is, Two movies. Yeah, two movies perfect. would have been perfect. It's the two three movies, movies is perfect. where we start getting problems. Definitely stunt cast a lot of stuff. Although I'll come, like I'll say, like that scene, uh, the the extended edition scene, scene uh, where uh, you have all of them there together, like in that round table room talking. Um, the meeting, meeting of the council, council the that council. adds so much context. Like I don't know if that's particularly stunt casting because it is. Uh, I feel like it is though, and I'll go. I'll go into it a bit later. But the there's that whole storyline's just bad and unneeded. Um, where I wanted to go next is someone that I've seen people complain about from these films quite often. I don't want to know if everyone else likes or loves him, Radagast. How do we feel about Radagast, Kieran? Radagast is a character who's only just mentioned in the book. Like, he's not a character in the book. He's just mentioned as one of the wizards when they list off all the wizards that are around. Radagast is the beginning of, like, (laughs) these movies. (laughs) (laughs) Like, and it's not the character's fault. It's just Radagast is the, the transportation for this whole plot line to begin, and that whole plot line is just unneeded and it, it, it it's thrown in there to once again remind people about lord of the rings and remind people that this movie leads directly into lord of the rings mm. it that's all this plot line is there for this fucking necromancer stuff this like you know finding the mogul blade the white council all of this stuff right is all this stuff does two things really for the movie is it tries to yeah incorporate lord of the rings and one of the things that it doesn't necessarily do in the books that this is trying to do, but you should it doesn't need to be done, is explain where the fuck Gandalf keeps fucking off to. Because in the book, Gandalf just ups and disappears a whole bunch. He is like, peace out, I've got stuff to do. And then he turns up a while later. And mm-hmm. I feel like the as you know, they've felt the need to explain that and be like, oh, this would be really cool for fans to show where Gandalf's going. It's like it I is personally this, I don't like, feel based on anything though? Is it in no. the appendices of like the uh the, not really. All of this stuff kind of happens. Novel of Under a Third Moon. No? This is, I believe, of the from what I remember, this is all stuff that has been added. Maybe it's in appendices somewhere. But this is not a functioning part of The Hobbit as a book. Because, you know, all of this stuff from leading into Lord of the Rings doesn't... Lord of the Rings doesn't exist yet when The Hobbit was originally written. Like, The Hobbit is the 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 kid's book that leads into The Lord of the Rings without realising that it's leading somewhere. Mm. And it's just all this stuff about the necromancer, about Radagast the Brown, and, and alerting Gandalf, and needing the White Council, and showing that 
Saruman, you know, it makes the White Council... I actually think the White Council scene makes the White Council look fucking dumb because it is so obvious that Saruman is, like, invested in this dark shit that's going on. Like, it's so, like, on Why? the nose is it just that he's, he like... Constantly is like no, I don't think we need to worry about that. No, that's dance. Let's yeah, no, no. This thing about the dwarves and a dragon. Let's focus on that, guys. Let's you know. Oh, this Morgul blade. Ah, just because that's there doesn't mean that nobody broke into that tomb or anything and resummoned that thing or that there's even a necromancer. Don't worry about that, guys. Let's focus on the dwarves. points from Gryffindor it's just, for Gandalf yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Um. I can understand all that. I gotta say though, I really enjoy Radagast. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I enjoy. The, no, no, don't get me wrong. I enjoy the character. Yeah. I enjoy the character, and I enjoy the portrayal of the character. What his part in this movie is, what I yeah is yeah. Where I I, I understand. So, all, yeah, I, he's part of a, a big issue, but Sylvester McCoy's having a, a great old time playing Radagast and I'm yeah. damp room bloody gun around on his little thing with all the rabbits and that i, I love the part where he, um, i can't remember oh what gets God, called that, down he's like they, they call down those so hounds or whatever and he's like i'll lead him away he's like you won't be able to run him and that he's like i'd like to see him try and he takes off or whatever <laughs> it's like go running us <laughs> see, see my problem with that is if you're trying to lead him away wouldn't you like lead them in the opposite direction <laughs> no, instead of the direction you're heading <laughs> you would think he's, he's, you would think so uh yeah, I don't mind him. You know, he's he's fun. I guess very much, I feel very childish. You know, uh, you know, and then he's got all these cute little animals that are all dying. You know, little hedgehog just dies on the screen. It's sad. Very sad. But he brings it back. It's fine. Kind of spiders. Yeah. Also, yeah. for arachnophobia, so be scared. Hmm. Yeah, they pulled the bug out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of it's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Thorin, Richard Armitage's uh, performance. Like, I feel like the portrayal of Thorin is really important to this this movie and the story, and getting him right where it's this this element of showing him both being like the strong leader while having like showing an element of like that weakness and the. You know what I mean? Like, and I think he does a really good job at playing that character throughout throughout these films. Like, or space this one since this one we just watched. I really like him in this role. Like, like at the start he shows up, he's really like, you know, straight away he has like a, a sense of like royalty about him. But you see in multiple scenes that he's definitely got some cracks in that armor, and he's just sort of holding himself together um, for for the rest of his people and stuff like that. So I really appreciate. It. I think he has the deepest performance in in this film with a lot, a lot of character tone. Uh, what what do you think of Thorin in this? Okay. Um, I think Thorin is an amazing character, written in the books as well as, as his portrayal here. <laughs> Once again, they try too hard to bring that out of Thorin, and they try too hard to have problems with Thorin. Um, the whole of Azog the Defiler's stuff isn't in the books, and. Just a lot of that is like a, you know, it kind of works multiple ways, but one of them is supposed to be having this kind of this uh, nemesis or this kind of rival for Thorin in a way. And it's 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 almost like they it feels like the movie is scared to rest Thorin's character development on dialogue and character interactions and his interactions through Bilbo and, and his relationship with Bilbo. Which for me is the strongest part of kind of the dynamic there is is and the strongest part of Thorin is is how he learns about himself and overcomes a lot of his own problems through Bilbo. But is like, no no no, we need him to be action orientated. We need him to have a cool fight scene with the, an orc. Like I not just, even cool fight scenes. I feel scenes. like they like, try that's to, the problem. Like the fight scenes aren't even good. Yeah. Enough. Like like it feels like they try too hard without being like, hey guys. Fucking the source material is fucking Tolkien. Just fucking use it and and respect that. Don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel and add more to it to try and get more out of this character. I can understand why they probably went that direction because for 160 minutes of this 180 minute movie, he's a dick to Bilbo, uh, our hero, the protagonist that we're all behind at the start of the film. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard to be like, yeah, go Thorin, you know. I want him to succeed. But you're not supposed to be like, yeah, go Thor. That's why but it's But I think that's movies. what they wanted. Uh, <laughs> you want him to get his throne back. You want him to get his home. You want to get him his crown. Um, 
that's a whole propulsion of the movie. So, you know, give it, make him heroic, give him this person to fight against. Uh, but, you know, he still has to be addicted to Bilbo the entire time. <laughs> yeah, I I agree that I think the the rivalry is totally unnecessary. I don't think the movie needed it at all. I think that the the parts where they fit in action scenes without the orcs like would have been totally fine for having action sequences within the film and adding i i also think he looks bad like cgi the character looks bad yeah he, mm -hmm. it doesn't look it just looks really plasticky he really should have been weird. a person to see yeah just looks off like i i can't wait to get like we have him and then we're going to go watch these films and eventually we're going to get to lord of the rings obviously and then we're going to see people in makeup the practical, practical who are going to look yeah. like I can I can see them in my head and how much scarier and mm -hmm. better they look. Yeah, like that's the problem. Like the even Urukai, like if you yeah. want to compare him to the original Urukai, um, like yeah, it's f fucking far and away difference in, in yeah. comparison. I really I hate that whole f that sequence on the tree and everything like that. The sequence yeah. is bad. It's bad. <laughs> it's probably one of my least favorite. Don't I was it's it's not. It's not, it's, it's, it's once again, feeling like they need to fit in more action and stuff where the actual way that thing plays out, where it's the goblins chasing them and they have a whole interaction with the eagles and the eagles come and save them and they have a deeper interaction with the eagles and the eagles are a well-formed character and you get to meet the Lord of the Skies and you just don't. They're just not random birds that keep showing up for no fucking reason. Why does Gandalf have these birds? I get it. He had them in Lord of the Rings. But why do they keep showing up? Why is there a fucking butterfly? Why didn't they what is take them whole... to Mordor to begin with? Yeah, we all know. That's yeah. the whole, And a lot of that is a lot of Gandalf's relationship. And the interesting shit about it is explained at this point in the movie. But they're like, nah, brah, flaming po pine cones. And then the tree gets knocked down. And then fucking bilbo proves himself this way it's like it's like yeah bilbo does all this stuff in the book already you don't need to rewrite how he does that it, it, it's just frustrating it's just yeah it wasn't action heavy enough i didn't mind it i've read the book so. <laughs> 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 fucking hell. um what do you reckon the best thing in this movie is thing here like what's a redeeming factor for you i i love i love uh the troll section yeah troll section is is great as i've already said that whole period is awesome and bilbo's interactions <laughs> with Gollum, yeah because that is the only bit that it should be in this movie that is like a hundred percent a thousand percent lord of the rings and should be enough for fans to sit there and be like oh i, I like Gollum and smeagol and i know what's gonna happen to them and man if fucking Bilbo had just stabbed him in the head right there. Probably would have saved Frodo a finger or something <laughs> down the line. Like That's it true. is, it is like that, that. That as a as a moment in the book and a moment for you know Gandalf being like, um, oh, I can't remember if it's Gandalf or Elrond. No, it's Gandalf. Gandalf. That is, yeah. it is not the strength to take a life, but the strength to not um to not take a life that is important. And and it's just that and how that affects everything going down in the future is fucking fascinating. But. Martin Freeman and Andy Serkis do a fantastic job of that whole segment. And it's, it's for me, it is, and it sounds like I don't want to be such a, a book nerd, a book stooge or whatever. I think whatever. you're fitting People that role like, in so this podcast, in book. So that's fine. We needed am, one, so it's yeah. perfectly good. Yeah, thank yeah. God. But I, I love the sections that are directly from the book. The, like, the the feeling of the the adventure and the fantasy and the mystery that is The Hobbit and the journey that is the Hobbit, without feeling like it needs people tinkering with it and changing stuff and and adapting it, because it, it almost goes, it does two things to me. It goes, one, it goes, oh, the audience is too stupid to realize what it was originally, or to is too stupid to enjoy it how it originally was. And to me, I just kind of find it disrespectful to towards Tolkien and, and his writing of the original material. Fair. Ash, what do you reckon your favorite part of this movie is then? No redeeming part. I would but. agree. Uh, I think that I think the Gollum Bilbo scene is probably the most intense sequence in the the film, uh, like full of tension and like seeing. Obviously, Andy Circus knows the character inside out, and like seeing the turns between the two variants of of Gollum um, is really cool, and like the switches between them and that 
Uh, just hearing him say Baggins is, is like <laughs> what? I told him all over again. Baggins <laughs> like it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I also love the the goblin chase sequence. I think that's so interesting. Uh, Dude, Gandalf's an absolute G. He like fucking rolls a boulder <laughs> down. Like he just yeah, goes just Donkey Kong and throws a <laughs> boulder down. Just and chases boulders, breaking bridges, tossing people all over the place. Uh, and then you know they somehow survive falling down the side of a cliff uh, and narrowly avoid being stabbed, uh, crushed by uh, Barry Humphrey's orc. Oh, goblin! Shout out to Barry yeah. Humphreys, by the way. Hmm. Yeah. What a bro. Does a good job. Shout out to Australia. I don't understand a lot of the <laughs> like all the, the the ropes and like all the the flying fox things going down. Because how are you supposed to get that back up? Walk. It's a long walk. It is. But they're goblins. They're nice I guess they got nothing is. else to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say I think my favourite scene is the Yeah, it's this the exact same one. It's the Smeagol scene, so um, well, um, I'll put the table. At, let me just hand the keys over to you. Karen. What is, yeah, what is the thing that makes you want to rage so much? Then, what what's on your? What do you need to get off your mind on this podcast about this movie? What haven't you complained about? <laughs> I feel like no. I feel like I, I've already I've already explained so much of it that it is just just the 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 need to. Change it to like I, I don't know. It's like somebody sat down and looked at the Hobbit and gone, "This isn't as epic as Lord of the Rings. This isn't as grand scale as Lord of the Rings. We need it to be grand scale as Lord of the Rings, and we need it to have direct connection through to Lord of the Rings." And it's like it it has that. It doesn't. It it, it doesn't. It was never supposed to be a, a giant epic because that's what Lord of the Rings is. The Hobbit is supposed to be a very much more a more humbler, smaller story about. Um, uh, about Bilbo Baggins and and how he evolves Baggins. into the person he becomes. Like it is, it's it's yeah. There's just so much. I it's just my greatest frustration, and we'll get it more and more. And I will be, you know, this is the high point of these three movies for me. Oh, I really? can already tell. The the this is oh, the boy. high point. Like the oh, other boy. two, it's the other two. I remember being very frustrated with and I and I will be for <laughs> multiple reasons. But this movie, yeah, is the high point of it. It captures some of the greatness of The Hobbit. It's just held down by these these Lord of the Rings things of the necromancer and and just needing to have things like, oh that's the Wraith King is is stabbing him down and he dodges it and he's got the Mogul Blade. How cool is that guys the Mogul Blade? It's just <laughs> ah it's just the, the funniest to, thing, the funniest thing is that everything you're saying, I I feel like most people who aren't hardcore Lord of the Rings fans watching this movie would watch these scenes and completely just blank over what's even happening. Like I don't, I. That's the thing, right? It, it's, okay. it's, it's somebody, yeah. Mm-hmm. Somebody, yeah, somebody who hasn't read the book doesn't know that all this Lord of the Rings stuff isn't in the movie, isn't in them, isn't in it originally, and has been added, and and it just. Uh, I feel like to me it just weighs everything down, and it just makes it unnecessarily long. It, 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 I often feel like somebody has turned around to Peter Jackson and said, "Hey, you need to make these movies two hours and forty-five minutes, and I want three movies. I don't want two movies. I don't want one movie. I want three movies." And Peter Jackson has to go, uh, "Okay, sure." And, and I, I don't know if he's passionate about adding all this stuff. It just doesn't feel like it's a, a a natural addition to this story is all of this stuff going on around him. It, it's just, yeah, it's very, I don't know, it just never sits right with me personally. All right. Any final thoughts from anyone that wants to go over anything we haven't missed? Shout out. I want to play yeah, a game with you. Before we get everyone. into our. I want to right, play a quick game. game a yep. quick game. A quick game where we call Throw It Into the Fire. But a bunch of stuff that I, you know, minor points that I get really annoyed with. Or <laughs> things that different have been added by Peter Jackson and the writing team that should it be kept in there or if it was possible to be thrown into the fires of Mount Doom, it should be. Starting with the movie opening. Um, not something I've talked about yet on this movie. The movie opening opens on a very grand scale where it lays out absolutely everything. Where it lays out 
what's the go with the dragon, what's the go with the dwarves, kind of escalates everything from the point instead of starting at a humble beginning for a hobbit. For me personally, I'm like, we don't need to escalate into this stuff. For me, it's we throw the opening into the fire where it's just the the starting five, ten minutes where it's going through the history of the dwarves and setting all that stuff up. That can be done elsewhere with Thorin and shit at the dinner. That is that is the first point. I keep it. No, I say I keep, keep it. it as well. Yeah. Keep it. And give, <laughs> us, give us. Let us see the dragon. Let us see them all die. Uh, see, you know. Yeah. See all the mining. See all before. I think if it was see, in the dinner scene, to- it would be too much. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I think it helps to have it right at the start and just get that get that information into the audience's head, and then you don't have to like jump away and do a flashback sequence later i think it's, it's like, why do we care about these dwarves yeah, i think it helps because then when they start showing up you as an audience member understand what the go is okay um adding in the start of the fellowship of the ring so adding in the whole sequence of frodo talking to bilbo and frodo making that big thing of i'm gonna go wait in the woods for gandalf because gandalf will be on his way for me i actually really like it keep it it just kind of shows Bilbo's thought process when he's writing this book um, and shows him in a point of reminiscing about everything that's gone before him. I throw it in the fire. <laughs> I knew you guys were going to say it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm fine with it. You can keep it, you know. It is a little bit of stunt casting. In it. I mean, as long as it bookended. I can't remember. It does bookend well. Is he in the I don't remember if it bookends well. I just know it bookends. It isn't in the no, second movie, but it goes back to movie, it in the yeah. third movie. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it goes back to it. Um, okay, the whole... I, I've chunked this together because otherwise it's going to take too long. The whole storyline of starting with Radagast the Brown going into the White Council, the Necromancer storyline, of course, setting up Sar- uh, Sauron returning to Lord of the, to, returning to Middle-earth um, and set, starting that whole mess of a plot. In this movie. You have to keep it. Otherwise, how how is Sauron meant to come back? He just does. He just does. He doesn't need to be explained. He just did. He's slowly been gathering his power. You don't need to explain that. It just happens. I'm throwing it in the fucking fire, bitches. <laughs> it's fucking melted. It's so melted. It's melted. It is. You know what? That storyline is so melted. That is the lava that the ring and Gollum fell into. We're gonna have to, it's going to have to be a bloody big fire is what I'm getting from this. <laughs> It's a fucking Mount Doom. It's massive. It's fine. I'm keeping it, but I want to rewrite oh. it. I think I think it could work. I don't think it's done well, but I think I think I don't think tying it in or attempting to tie the Hobbit into Lord of the Rings is necessarily a bad idea. I think it's done. Not. Yeah. I don't think it's done well in this movie. I think for most people, it's even done in a way that they'll be confused. Like, they're trying to tie it into a movie that people have seen. I feel like people who have seen Lord of the Rings would still be watching it going, I don't understand quite what's happening. I feel like it's... it's so, for that, I feel like it doesn't achieve what it what its, what its goal is. So, um, But I'm going to keep it solely because, yeah, I, I need to... Like, I, I've only got two options, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying keep. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, all right. for future ones, we'll, we'll add a third option, which is reforging. Okay. I will, so I will choose yeah. into some I'm choosing yeah. reforge. Reforge. Then. reforge. Okay, reforge it. We'll, we'll add the third option. Ashley, did you say keeping it? I said reforge it then, yeah. Reforge it? Okay, reforge is a solid option. All right. Um, second to last yeah, one. As of, the, <laughs> as of the Defiler... Um, having him as a, I guess, the first big bad villain in this movie, having him being hunting down the dwarves throughout this, um, and of course the final scene of him trying to fight um, Thorin. For me, it is, once again, throw it into the fire, isn't needed. There are other characters that could be chasing them. The goblins chase them quite effectively normally. Um, So for me, yeah, that... I will say... The extended cut actually gives him a little bit more character, a little bit more understanding compared to the theatrical. Throwing it into the fire. Damn straight. Uh, <laughs> I think there's this stuff there. Like, oh my god, I hate this so much. I hate this. <laughs> you, know? I, you know what? I'm not going to lose my mind as much. If shit's getting kept in the next two movies, I'm going to be so mad. There is so much bad stuff that needs to be 
It's just making him, him a person in a suit. Can I say, prepare yourself for disappointment, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I already know. I'm already prepared. Uh, and then the final one for this segment, the Storm Giant sequence. Something that in the book is like half a line that is about two Storm Giants having a boulder fight in the distance. All of a sudden becomes this big old CGI slash practical effects nonsense that takes up a good maybe five, ten minutes almost of these rocky mountain creatures throwing boulders at each other while the actors, whoa, get stuck on them, which is not something that happened. It's throw it into the fire along with the storm giants themselves. I'm throwing it in the fire as well. I've got to keep them. They're great. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to say this just to, just to trigger me. Now. That yeah. is it. Not enough stuff was thrown into the fire this week, people. If you think it should have been thrown into the fire, tweet at <laughs> Ashley Hobley and tell them. It's fine. Yeah. I don't think that the frost giants, I don't think they fit in the fire. Like they okay. Lava would just fly out everywhere and then, you know. Fucking hell. <laughs> it's like when you're just putting a large box in your recycling bin, okay? You just got to cram it down a little bit and really push it in and just use the sides of the recycling bin as leverage. You know, it's a. It's a whole process. Yep. Thank you for joining us for our debut. Yes, Ashley Hobley. One last shout out to Brett McKenzie. Do you, uh, you know? Got to play one of the L's from Fire of the Concords. Oh, yeah. After his init- his uh, original you know theme song his- for the Lord of the Rings was uh, denied. Uh, originally, it was rejected. I, I think. Got to be in the, the next set of movies. <laughs> The funny thing is, I feel like a lot of his scenes are in the extended cut that one in the theatrical cut. Probably. Because he is Elrond's, like, uh, house yeah. steward or, or whatever. Yeah. Or just kind of, yeah, running around doing stuff. Thank you for joining us for our debut episode <laughs> of the Lord of the Rings Extended Middle Earth Podcast. Check out ExplosionNetwork.com for all of our other podcasts, including the aforementioned on the Marvel cast. If you're into Marvel Holocron entries, if you're into Star Wars, what do you want to watch if you want to hear me and Ash talk about movies and TV next week? We will be talking about The Hobbit, The Desolation of Schmaug. Mm-hmm.